Ignatius was, in a sense, I think one of the primary uh, psychologists in the church. Because of his experience during his recovery period, when by God's grace, he was forced to read the New Testament and the lives of Dominic and Francis because he was so bored out of his mind. And with that grace, he found out how he felt as he read these things compared to thinking about going back to the court where he lived quite a raucous life. Understanding the interior movements of his own heart is really understanding for the first time how you in your emotional and intellectual life are like a musical instrument on which the spirit plays your song. And if you don't listen, you miss the whole melody. And so in his, in his recovery time, he, he really began to realize that he was barking up a wrong tree. That the momentary satisfaction or flush of pleasure that he got in thinking about going back to the life of the court dissipated. It was gone, like a puff of smoke after a while. But the deep peace and joy he felt from reading about the lives of these holy ones and getting to meet Jesus in the actual scriptures stuck with him, lasted. And so he began to weigh those things, went to Manresa and fell on his face in the cave and said, what do you want? And the Jesuits was the answer. So coming from that wonderful tradition and the charism of that type of discernment in, uh, in the 1500s, when the church was splitting in pieces, we're going to look, we're going to the sewer today. Sorry, we're going to the sewer today. Because we need to get the whiff of the pollution of sin and we can only really get that clearly by going back to the foundations. So um, I'd like to look at this title for just a few minutes. We cannot understand sin unless we put it in the context of the fact that the one who loves us has been poured out, and we say this at every liturgy, poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sin. So it's done. The sewer is cleaned. And what we have to be careful of is not polluting it again. So our study of this topic together is to really un help us to understand the proportion of the love that has come to save us and continues to do that, it's done. It's not going to be done. It's done. As a baptized Christian, your sin is gone. You have a hangover. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the difference between original and actual sin. But you, that hangover simply wants to come and like the demons who have been chased out, wants to come back, bring seven more, and make the place worse than it was in the first place. That's where you have to do what Jesus gives us as two commands. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch is first, which means you've got to put your finger to the wind, and you've got to know when it stinks. Now I'm using uh, an, uh, more of a, than a visual, I'm using, you know, an olfactory sense here. Because sin can be dealt with most aptly by stench. We hate to walk into a room and have that putrid, mildewed, or rotten egg odor, sulfur odor. We just, we get our, our automizer out right away. But well, when you think of sin, 
you know, I, I'm going to suggest you employ your olfactory <coughs> sense, your sense of smell. And discernment is very, very much putting your finger to the wind. Discernment is very much picking up that you've got a bad odor. My example always, I'm from Milwaukee. I'm from the other beer town. <laughs> and on a certain day in Milwaukee, this is what you got. The mixture of hops from the beer, the mixture of, of chocolate from the ambrosia place, and when the wind was right, the stockyards. Now you put those three together, and you have an odiferous smell of Milwaukee. And you didn't go outside for a while. So use that sense, not just your visual or your auditory, but your, your, your smell to when you deal with this topic. I'm going to suggest you do that. And I'm going to put this in the context of that liturgy phrase so that every time you hear it when you're at Mass, you can hear the priest when he holds that, that chalice in his hands and he says, it's done. And you feel like you've just gotten out of a clean shower. We need to feel that. We need to know that. We need to remind ourselves of that. Because when you're squeaky clean, you're not going to go and have people throw mud pies at you. You can only get the proportion of the sinfulness against that love. And that's what Ignatius does with the foundations. He, see, he, he founds you in that love. And then the first week, what is it? It's sin. So now let's go there. Um, OK, let's, let's move on. And let's go. Uh, I'm starting with the foundation and why it's critical. Uh, but I'd like to look for a minute on helping us just brush up a little bit of our, our catechism and whatever theology we have on the difference between what we call original and actual sin. Well, we say Adam and Eve, original sin. That's what they did in the garden, right? We need to go back a little further than that. We need to go back and realize that the angels started it off. The angels and Adam and Eve, in my view, are a package, and they are a package bringing forth for the first time in divine history and what is going to be the unfolding of time space when we have the entropy of, the, of the, what we call the Big Bang, which was probably a word, not a bang. And we have, we have matter forming, and then we have the human being coming through evolution and then we have time space putting their mark on what started with the angels. Sin is, in the Hebrew scriptures, the word is ermartia. It means you aimed and you missed the mark. The mark, the bullseye, is being a full human being. And what is a full human being? A full human being is a lover. A lover. One who has, by grace, grace makes capacity in the human for the dwelling of God. So you become a Shekinah. You become the, the, the temple. And that's his dwelling place. So sin is you miss that mark. You go off target. And what, what are you operating your choices by? Prideful selfishness. It's egotistical introversion. Prideful selfishness is every form of sin. And we'll talk about the, the way it breaks down in a minute. Original, the original prideful selfishness is that of the angels. You do that and we will not serve. What's the that? We think it was revealed to them in their test 
that the eternal word of God, which they worshiped, the eternal expression of God, there's God the mystery, God expressing, and God acting. We call that Father, Son, and Spirit. But there are, God doesn't have three heads, sorry. God is God, God is love. Love in its depth mystery we call Abba, Father. Love in its self-expression we call Son or Word. Love in its active dynamic we call Spirit. Same God, but there is a distinction. And the distinction is only in the relationship. God is one. So when your Jewish or your Muslim friends say, oh, you Christians, you're tri-theists, you say, no, 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 one God, just like you. And then you explain it to them that a singer needs a song. And you can't have a singer with a song unless you've got singing. The singer is the Abba, Father, the song is the sweet word, and the singing is the spirit. You cannot have one, they all fall apart. The relational, it's grammar. In English, it's just plain grammar. So you have a singer, you have a song, and you have the singing, or you have the river, and its source comes up from the spring, and then you see the water, and then the water is flowing. You can't separate those things. The river is the river, but there's its source, its water, and it's flowing. Now, we are not here for a Trinitarian course, but this is the understanding that really is pure love in its three dimensions. The angels then said, if that word is going to marry physicality, plain English, atomic structure and DNA, we aren't going to serve. That's disgusting. Prideful selfishness appears. Prideful selfishness is idolatry. My thinking, my preference is above yours, God. So I'm my little idol. Prideful selfishness. Now we're going to see that it will, it will take many forms, but it's always the same pustule in the boil. Now I'm sorry for such a gross image, but you all know when you have an infection or a boil, there's a core in there. You've got to get that core out, otherwise it will reinfect, right? Well, I just explained the core to you. The core is prideful selfishness. Now, I make that distinction because there is a self-care that is not prideful. And we need to distinguish. So in the original sin, it's echoed in the human in the garden, but it is the same pustule. The angels, we will not serve. In the garden, the image is given now in the human framework, and the image is, well, you told me not to eat that, but I'm, I, I would like to be like God, so I'm going to eat it. Prideful selfishness. And the fruit po was poisonous to them. But they couldn't, they couldn't listen to the one who loved them. So the choice, it's by choice that, that the self aggrandizement, it's be, it, the human or the angelic reality, which is purely non-physical, becomes, as it were, bloated, as if you're, you suddenly, you blew up like a balloon that they carry on New York for Christmas time. Y yourself becomes bloated with your prideful selfishness 
in one form or another. Okay, so what happens then, this original tendency, this leaning to make myself the center of my life, is a smell that hangs over and the pustule, the core of it, was removed from you by your baptism. So it doesn't have to reinfect. But there is a hangover and a leaning and it's all around you. It's in the media. It's in business. It's in human relations where I want to be the big cheese and you can go to you know where. Prideful selfishness. And so very aptly in the image in Genesis, it's the snake bite. You have to be careful not to get bitten again. The image is that of a serpent. You've got to be careful not to get bitten again. You are clean. Redemption has happened. You don't go back to the pigsty and wallow with the pigs, which is Jesus' beautiful image that must have disgusted the Jews. <laughs> are, you, are you with me so far? All right, so actual sin is when you get bitten again, when you bite into that fruit, bitten or bite, whatever, use your image. The question is, it is going to be a, like a, a luring, it's gonna seduce you, all, it's all around you. All you've got to do is listen to the news, and you can see, if you don't believe in original sin, listen to the news. And you'll see how it's, it's like a cobra in the basket calling to you. And if you go there, you reinfect. So within the church, we have reconciliation to take care of those stupid moves. If you're not in the church, well, you've got to take care of it the best you can. But it's a, it is a human thing. It is not just a Catholic thing. This is not just a Catholic story, folks. This is a human story. So we have the, the primal sin, what we call the primal sin or the original sin, both angelic and human. And so this, this propensity for idolatry, which is brought forward in the Hebrew scriptures as the only sin in its different forms. You read the, New, the Old Testament carefully and you'll see that it's idolatry, 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 idolatry. And we think idol, we think, moi, says Miss Piggy, moi. Okay, so uh, we need to keep you know, kind of our, our point of view wide here and know that actual sin is when I actualize that prideful selfishness. When it's been removed from me. So I'm, in small ways or large, I go back to my pigsty. Now, okay. The meaning of sin then is prideful selfishness. So. We're gonna, we're gonna go on from there and take a look at the forms it takes. Now, this is not news to you, what you see up here. This is not news. This is from the desert fathers and mothers. They're called the seven capital sins. Why are they called kaputs or capital? Because they're resembling the pustule. They're a, a customized pustule that wants to kind of relocate in your soul. The Desert Fathers in Cappadocia and uh, it's Turkey, the area of Turkey, if you go there, you will see the caves that they lived in and there were desert mothers. The women lived in apartments. The, the volcanic ash in Cappadocia of the mountains are, is so, so pliable that you can dig yourself a cave with a teaspoon. This, the ash is so, so soft that you can dig a hole and then pull up your ladder and you can keep your solitude. And the women had conjoined caves. 
The men were hermits more, and eventually they came together and had, had prayer together, and then they, there's actual chapels in those caves that you can find with very primitive, almost first grade-like paintings, uh, mosaic or paintings of the mysteries. So the, the, this moved from the eremitical life to a cenobitical life. Cenobitical means around the table. So they worshiped together and then they began to eat together. It was better than having everybody cook alone. And we had monasteries by the year 500. But anyway, that, that is really where the seven capital sins come from. These mystics, in their deep prayer, realized that there were these seven major ways that this original primal sin tries to get a hold of you again. The East, and by the East I mean the Buddhist tradition and the Sufi tradition in Islam, give us two more. The same seven. They, it's interesting that in different parts of the world, these prayerful people come up with the same seven sins or pustules, plus the East gives us two more, making nine. Now, the number nine is going to put on lights in your head because you're going to say, oh, that's Enneagram. That's Enneagram. Yes, you're correct. The Enneagram is nothing but the seven capital sins plus two. Plus two. I'll, I'll get to the two when we look, go around the, the ring here. Let's, let's look at them. Sloth, sloth is a tendency. Now, you're going to spot yourself as I go around this little ring, so um, don't be denying now. Just be open to what you know goes on in here. Sloth is a tendency to disappear when there's conflict. I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to, I'm just not going to be there. I don't want to, I don't want to disturb the peace. So I'm, uh, I don't want to, I'm not going to emotionally, physically, nor spiritual respond. I'm just going to back off. Sloth is when you don't act when you should. Sloth is when you, you take the easy route and you are not going to stand up for your baptism. You're not going to stand up uh, truth to power. You're not going to tell somebody, no, I, I think your viewpoint needs to be expanded here. And I would suggest thinking about this and this and this. And they look at you like you fell off a Christmas tree. Because you don't debate. You tell the truth. And you do it respectfully without you know, putting them down. Sloth says, don't bother. Second, you have resentful anger. Anger is not a sin, folks. Anger is an emotion. If you are not angry, when you hear about the boycotts in T. Gray, so those people can't get food, I want to see if you're still alive. OK? Resentful anger is smoldering. It's this revengeful passive aggression where you know somebody somebody said something to you and now whenever you 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 get to see them you don't talk to them anymore you walk by and they say wow oh, what's wrong with her what's wrong with him because they've got something against you and you don't even know what it is that's passive aggression that's resentful anger that is using a weapon, the weapon of your isolation and your ignoring to punish somebody, and they don't even know what they're being punished for. Instead of you going to them, as the gospel says, and say, you know, when you talk that way and use that kind of language, you know, that's really hurtful for me. It brings back memories of my dad who really had a mouth on him. Whatever you're going to say, but tell them. Don't act from the bushes with your, your weapon pow, pow, from under the bushes. That's passive aggression. And anger that, that is resentful like that is abusive. OK? Vainglory is a very sneaky way in which 
this prideful selfishness visits because it looks so holy and good. Vainglory is the person who is convinced that they are not worth a tinker's dam until they're doing something. Vainglory means I gotta do this, I gotta do that. It's compulsive do good means. I've gotta do it, I've gotta do it, otherwise people will think ill of me and they, their schedule is off the wall. They don't even have time to brush their teeth. And they're very depressed because I've got so much to do because they're not taking care of me. This is an inverted self-destruction because I've got to keep doing all these things so I look good. That's vain glory. It's doing good for the wrong reason. It can affect nurses. It can affect parents. It can affect grandmothers. It can affect teachers and social workers, people in the medical field, because they are service oriented. See how sneaky this is? For good people, remember one of the laws of discernment, good people cannot be deceived by evil. The odor is so strong they just say, out of here. They have to be deceived by their goodness. Their goodness has a hook in it. And so in that goodness, there is a self-destruction. That's why in the social justice movements of the communities, if the social justice people do not have a sound spirituality, they will be disposed of through burnout. That's the hook. It's protest evil, you're protesting evil. But if you don't take care of yourself, you'll be on the mat and good for nothing. And Satan laughs his head off. Satan is the unquarantined one who has every virus you want to name and he's willing to share them with anybody using today's language. Deceit is one of the two that are added by the East. Chronic deceit. This is the person who can sell you your own pair of shoes. These are the people who want to twist you into buying, voting, uh, whatever. They want to get you on a bandwagon that is fully deceitful. You don't believe that's happening, look at the news. If it smacks of some politics today, you got that right. Chronic deceit is you lie about everything. You lie about your goals, you lie about your need to, to be at the job 24 seven, so you never have time for your family. You, you, you lie to yourself because you need this or you need that or you ought to buy this, or you ought to buy that, or you don't really have to take care of your water because there's plenty of it, and who cares that those people don't have water? So you don't even bother to turn the faucet off when you brush your teeth. You don't have to do all those environmental things. Those are for other people. Now, I'm sorry if I'm stepping on toes here, but this is the form it takes. It's chronic deceit. I'm told you we're visiting the sewer today, okay? Envy, envy is a very quiet virus, a very quiet, envy is when you look at that person next to you or you look at those folks down the block from you and you know, they've got their life so together. My life is a mess. You know, I don't have, my house is not in order and my, you know, I, I should clean my closet out. My garage looks awful. I bet theirs isn't that way. 
Envy is always there something wrong with me because I don't measure up to somebody else. It's very concrete and it's very much a homey. It likes to make its home in people's possessions and uh, it makes you needy. It makes you needy. Nothing is enough. You have to have more. Because the neighbors do. So you're always comparing yourself to the neighbor. And you always come out short. It's a sneaky, but it is prideful selfishness customized to fit in your little life. Be watchful. Greed is very, very public in our country. Through corporations, maybe even through the pharmaceuticals, through different professions. When the bottom line is the green stuff that comes in, well, you know, you may get the wrong prescription or you may get opioids that'll put you into some kind of a dependency, but well, my check came in. It's all I'm going to worry about. Greed is the little old lady who has a box in her closet on the top shelf with a label on it. Pieces of string, too small to use. I'm not kidding you. The greedy person is a collector. The greedy person has all sorts of stuff. They don't even know what they have anymore. The stuff is a substitute for the security. They don't feel secure, so they surround themselves with all this stuff. Then they feel like they're safe. The only security is at the end of a bungee rope. Faith means take the plunge. Your dependency is in God who holds you even when you jump on with that bungee rope, even when you hang glide. These people have a hard time that frightens them. And so they stuff their houses and their wardrobes and their drawers with stuff, and they don't even know it's there. It's an idolatry. It's a form of worship that is other than God. Again, sorry if I'm stepping on toes, but I'm not sorry in exposing it. Chronic fear is the other nine, the other, the other eight, nine. A chronic deceit and chronic fear are the two additions from the Far East to the desert fathers and mothers. Chronic fear is 60% of the human population. If the, if the tabulation uh, by psychologists is correct, that this form of egoism, all of these are forms of egotistical self-worship. So this form of egotism or egoism is so common that it is almost invisible. 60% of all humanity uh, suffer from this, what I might call, uh, tendency that, that it, it, it is fearful. Everything is, ha is about my security. It isn't, for these people, it isn't just stuff. It's my involvement. It's, it, you know, they will never go to a theme park and ride on a, a daredevil ride. Oh, no, I might fall off. You know, th this is chronic fear that keeps you really in a bubble, as if you're the child who who's doesn't have an immune system, and, and therefore you've got to live in your little bubble. When it's really, really chronic, it can take two forms. They will be absolute legalists. 
Keep the law, and the law will keep you. These are the people who, when they're driving through the desert on the way to San Francisco, and there's a red light, at midnight, they will stop in the desert because there's a red light at midnight. Well, it's the law. The other form of this is flagrant law breakage. These people want to so get rid of this fear clinging to them that they will deliberately break the law. When this kind of person gets arrested, for example, they, they will tell you, I don't, I'm not afraid to die. I died. When that police officer came and picked me up off of the railroad tracks and put those handcuffs on me, I died because they had broken through their fear by an illegal act that put them in jail. Like one of our sisters, in, she was in Utah, she came before the judge and the judge said, $25. She had sat on the railroad tracks when the nuclear train came through, the white engine that goes around towns in the middle of the night so people don't see it because it's carrying nuclear warheads. And she sat on the tracks. She looked up at the judge and she said, I don't have $25, Your Honor. And he said, case dismissed. He had done his duty. Arrested her, charged her. She didn't pay it, and she went home. This is, this is a very delicate <clears throat> a very delicate uh, infection because there's a certain amount of caution that we all have to live our lives with. You don't act like an idiot. You don't drive without your seatbelt. But these people are compulsive about their security. Okay? Gluttony is pretty obvious. But it's not, it's not necessarily about food or drink. There are people among us, and I don't have to name them, who are gluttonous for touch, ladies and gentlemen. The primary need is not food and drink. Our primary need as human beings is for touch. If you grew up in a family where never, you were never hugged, your little back was never rubbed, nobody ever kissed you all over your face, no dad ever wrestled with you on the floor and tickled you until you almost wet your pants. If that was lacking in your life, you might grow up to be a pedophiliac. And where do you go for your comfort? Children, because that's what you have lost. I'm not saying that's true. I'm not a psychiatrist. All I'm saying is we have to look deeper in why someone consecrated to God should do this kind of activity. And it might be this wound. Okay? So gluttony is the proper touch to the spouse, the proper touch to the one that you're dating, the proper touch and not disrespecting or going past what we would say is your, your boundaries, whether it's I stuff myself with junk food, I drink too much when I'm at a party. Those are all manifestations of this wound, trying to once more infect you and fill you with sewage. Last of all is lust. Lust is self-personal disposal. Self is using a person, I mean, lust is using a person and then disposing of them, like a Kleenex, slightly used. It doesn't necessarily, it can be sexual, but it can be 
relational in the job, someone not getting a promotion because that secretary would grant no sexual favors. So we can do without her. Lust is, can work psycho-spiritually, psychosomatically, psycho-spiritually. Lust is using a person and disposing of them, however you do that. Economically, and you'll see that in the social sin a little bit later, you'll see that, that it, it gets large and it becomes corporate. Each one of these sits within a person, and each one of these infections can become communal, systemic. Yes, it's a pretty bad picture, and as we listen to the news, we keep saying to ourselves, what next are they going to turn up? We are having a house cleaning, folks. This virus time is turning up every rock with every creepy crawler has ever, that has ever been in the United States, from our racism and our white privilege to our economic, uh, economic injustice. It's turning up everything. This is house cleaning is going on. So I would like to remind you to whom this country belongs. This country belongs to the Immaculate Mother of God, and she does not suffer fools. She's house cleaning, I would suggest to you. And it's big time, and it's stinky, and there's all sorts of lice, and there's all sorts of rats, and there's all sorts of roaches. I'm sorry to be that graphic, but you get my point. Now, what do we do about personal sin? We're going to wind up here. As you look at the next frame, you see I'm giving you just a little self-talk. If you have identified, and folks, there's not many. If there are two or three that you've identified, some of them are sidekicks. You've got to get to the boss. The boss is one of these, one of these. And that should be the object of your confession. When you go to confession, stop going through those grocery lists, OK? The grocery lists are effects of this. Check on this and talk this over with the priest of how I can be more alert and watchful when this thing tries to raise its ugly head in my basket like a cobra. And so a bit of self-talk. A bit of self-talk. The, the, really the, the, the more professional term here in the exercises is go agere contra. The Latin phrase agere contra is, is to go against. It means to go against. So you've got to watch for when the cobra raises its head, and then you have to shut the lid down. Slam the lid down and say, you're out of here. I don't want to listen to you. So these little, these little phrases are like agera contra arrows, or slamming the lid down. When sloth is your thing, you need to simply say, catch yourself and say, do it, girl. Do it. Go there and tell them what you really think is the truth. Oh, and you say, I'd rather stay home in my slippers. Do it. With, this, with the vain glory, smile. These are the people who need the phrase, I'm OK, you're OK. For some people, that's sick, because they, they have nothing to correct. But this person has to know that they are beloved of God, and they don't have to do anything to earn it. So smile. Smile when you look in the mirror and say, good morning, prince. Good morning, princess, because you are royal. Your baptismal character is priestly, royal, 
and prophetic. Claim it. Name it. Claim it. Tame it. And don't blame it. Don't blame it and then tame it. That's, that's the Jesuit little model. Name it. That's watchful. Name it. Claim it. It's mine. It's my problem. I don't blame anybody. Don't blame it. You do not kick a sick person. Well, you're sick. You need to be healed, not kicked. Do not blame it and tame it. Tame it means go archery contra. Okay, now that's, I think, sound Jesuit teaching. But if there's the Jesuit in the room or the Jesuits in the room, you can see me after and tell me where I've gone astray. Okay, <laughs> because I'm a Dominican who studied the Jesuits. Okay, all right. Uh, the next one is the, the envy. Yep, okay, the envy is instead of, oh, they're, 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 they're so good and they've got... Say bravo to yourself. Stop looking at the other person. When you have done a beautiful design in your home, say bravo to yourself. Not, I don't think it's as pretty as Marilyn's next door. No, 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 you don't go there. Go for it is fear. Instead of, oh, I'm gonna just, see it's a little different, it's more action oriented than sloth. Sloth is a, an emotional attitude of non-involvement. It's, it's an emotional isolation. Whereas fear is you don't want effects. You're afraid of losing your security. Oh well, anger, resentful anger, uh, just to say, oh well, it's not perfect. Oh well, she probably didn't mean that. Oh well, brush it off, water off a duck's back instead of vengeful, revenge, passive aggression. Truly, the, the deceitful person who always wants to sell you something, truly, I, I'm telling you about this truthfully, truly, no, I didn't have lunch with President Obama. I really didn't, I, I said that, but I really never had lunch with him, okay, to impress you. Greed, is here. I got three of these. Here. I got two of these. I don't need two of these. Here. Share. That will take care of your greed. And, and, and gluttony is, can I live with less? Can I live where I don't have to have all of this? Instead, can I make sure somebody who doesn't even have food gets something because I've got so much? This is a very personal thing. Personal, very personal thing. And finally, for the lustful person who uses a person and disposes to always ask the question, and you? How do you feel? Where are you with this? Is this what you want? And you. I know what I have a tendency to do. But you? So those are just little contra. Audre contra self-talk. Last frame, the last frame, and we wrap up here. The, the question here is that first of all, that little mantra of Jesus, learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. My Father's will is my meat. It's not me. It's not me. So it is developing a sense of we, not me, we. That, that really cuts prideful selfishness off at the, at the root. When it's we, what is the benefit of, of the body? Not just me. Not just my house, not just my family, not just my white race, not just my business. 
So that's, now the, the little quiet there is, yesterday was the Feast of Trees to uh, uh, Avalon, the big, big, marvelous mystic. And from, from her, I offer this to you when you pray. To get wise to this, you can pick yourself to death like a chicken. Don't do that. When you pray, I don't care how you pray, morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you take your time, three minutes before you do anything, do nothing. Teresa says do nothing. Sit there and let him look at you. Let the risen Christ, whose only eyes you will see, you will not see the face, because that's for after death. But you will have eyes, and they will be filled with tears. Or they'll be filled with laughter. Or they will be filled with concern, depending on how you come to your prayer. Let him look at you and sit there on the hot seat, because that gaze will draw from you whatever your wound is. That gaze will draw from you whatever poison is trying to attack you. And it will make it clear to you what to do. You will not learn this by reasoning. You will learn this by loving. You will learn this because love surrounds you and he looks at you with such tenderness and love. Why? Because he's afraid you're going to get scared and run away. Which you're going to be tempting to do because nobody likes to be looked at. So sit in the hot seat, three minutes, and time yourself. Put your watch on your knee if you want to, or put a timer on, because you're going to want to, you're going to run a cut it short. The prayer of the gaze. Teresa of Alva said to her newbies, her novices, my child, you do this for six months and you will have developed a contemplative consciousness because he will do it, not you. Okay? Amen. Amen.